July 2nd, 1928, Lake Kachewanooka, Ontario, Canada. Lucy stayed absolutely still, knowing her life was in danger. Her heart pounded, but she concentrated on not making the slightest sound. Instead, she squatted behind a stack of wooden crates in the deep shadows at the back of the boathouse. It was a beautiful day outside, with sunlight glinting on the surface of the lake, but it was shady here in the old wooden boathouse. Despite the reedy damp air, Lucy could feel a trickle of perspiration at the back of her neck. She wanted to wipe it away, but she forced herself not to move and stayed crouched on the floor, her hands clasped round her knees to stop them from knocking together. She listened to the two men who entered the boathouse. The bigger man, Brent Packham, was a wealthy businessman who was rumoured to be involved with running whiskey and rum across the Canadian border into America, where selling alcohol was still illegal. Smuggling liquor was a trade that involved gangsters, and Lucy had thought it would be exciting to sneak into the grounds and do a little snooping at the, on the lakeside estate that Brent Packham had rented for the summer. She thought that her friends Will and Mike would be impressed with her daring, but now she was terrified she was going to witness a murder. The house and grounds were north of the town of Lakefield, on the upper corner of Lake Kachumanooka, near where Lucy and her mother lived, on the Autonomy Reserve, with other members of the Ojibwe tribe. The thought of her mother made Lucy wish she was home now, but there was no use longing for the security of being with Mom. She'd got herself into this fix, and she'd have to get herself out again. Now that she was 12, Lucy had been given the freedom to explore the nearby lakes in her canoe while painting and sketching. It was how she'd met Will and Mike, though she hadn't told Mom about making friends with boys who didn't live in the reserve. This afternoon, she'd been following a trail along the wooded shoreline when she almost stumbled onto the two men. Their voices alerted her just in time, and she ran into the rambling old wooden boathouse. Unfortunately, the men stopped at the door. Let's step inside, said Brent Packham. Lucy ducked behind a pile of wooden crates and held her breath. We won't be disturbed here, said Packham, entering the boathouse. Lucy peeked out. She was frightened of being found, but also curious about what was going on. Mr. Packham was said to have a shady past, but he owned a brewery and a transport company in the nearby city of Peterborough. He was a big, muscular man with oiled black hair, and although he dressed in fine clothes, almost to the point of being a dandy, there was still an air of threat about him, the sense of someone that it would be foolish to cross. The other man was slighter and less prosperous looking. I'm glad you came to see me, Jake, Packham said. Always better to iron out problems man to man. That's what I think too. So? So I think we should renegotiate. Each month we're shifting more whiskey across the border, Mr P, making you a fortune. So he was a smuggler, thought Lucy. I'm running a profitable business, said Packham, his tone reasonable, and you're sharing those profits. Not sharing them enough. I say it is enough, and I say it's not. Lucy listened intently, intrigued despite her nervousness. Then don't work for me, said Packham, his voice taking on a hard edge. The Varelli family are eager to expand. I can go to them. I'm your American partner. Using someone else? That would bring problems. So now you're threatening me, Jake, said Packham. And Lucy knew instinctively that despite Packham's controlled tone, the man called Jake was living dangerously. Just stating the facts, he said. Let me state a fact, said Packham. Lucy heard a quick rustle of clothes, then a sharp intake of breath. This is the Colt 45, said Packham, and I've used it before. How do you like that fact? Lucy bit her lip in fear. On the reserve, people hunted for food with rifles, but Lucy knew what a Colt pistol was and the kind of damage you could do at close range. Please, Brent, said Jake. I was just, I was just negotiating. Really? Sounded like you were threatening my business. It wasn't personal, Jake. I swear, it was just, just dealing. Threaten my business and you threaten me. I can't have it out there that Brent Packham can be threatened. No, Brent, please, we can work this out. No one needs to know, but I'd know, Jake, and you'd know. You'd know you threatened me and got away with it. I can't have that. Lucy felt her heart pounding as though it were going to explode. She thought of the words of her pastor, who said all it took for bad things to happen was for good people to do nothing. And if she did nothing, Brent Packham was going to kill another man. But if she stepped out of her hiding place and pleaded for Jake's life, what would happen then? A man who was willing to shoot his business partner, even if that partner was a gangster, might have no qualms about killing her as a witness, especially as she was a trespasser and from the Ojibwe Reserve. I'm sorry I offended you, Brent, pleaded Jake, but we can fix this. I see your point. I understand if to pay a price, so how's this? Instead of increasing my share, I drop my price. As a peace offering, I drop my share by 10% for the rest of the year. What do you say, Brent? Say yes, thought Lucy. Please, say yes. There was a pause, then Packham spoke. I don't think so, Jake. Threatening me was stupid and greedy. Worst of all, it was a betrayal. Bad move. Fatal move. Please, Brent, I'm sorry, look, we, we'll make it 20, no, 25%. You'll never get a deal like this from the Varelli family. What do you say, Brent? 
25% of a saving, and I swear I'll never let you down again. Lucy heard his trigger being cocked. Despite all her efforts to remain still, she flinched at the sound. To her horror, she realised she'd pushed backwards against the boathouse wall, which creaked. It wasn't a loud sound, but had Packham heard it? Lucy looked around in panic. There was a door in the rear wall of the boathouse. If she got it open now, maybe she could get out the back before Packham got to her. Or would that be suicidal? Were Packham likely to shoot her in the back as she tried to run away? Time seemed to stand still, and she struggled to control her panic. She looked at the door five or six feet away and listened intently to hear if Packham was coming. She tried to still her mind and think clearly, run and maybe escape, but also maybe get shot, or stay and risk discovery, but maybe get away with it. Suddenly, the decision was made for her as Packham spoke and Lucy realised that his attention was still focused on Jake. You were a two-bit hoodlum when I met you, said Packham. I gave you your break and you stabbed me in the back. No loyalty. In your heart of hearts, you're still a two-bit hoodlum. No, Brent. Yes, Brent, cried Packham, his voice raised. You're not worth a bullet. I won't waste one on you. Packham had raised his voice in anger for the first time, yet despite cocking the pistol, he was now saying he wouldn't shoot? But he just wanted to terrify Jake to teach him a lesson? Lucy prayed that this was the case and that the two men would leave the boathouse alive. But part of her felt that was too good to be true. Maybe Packham was lying about not wasting a bullet. Maybe he was playing cat and mouse with his victim while intending to shoot him in the end. Before Lucy could agonise any further, there was a flurry of movement and the sound of a sickening blow, immediately followed by a cry from Jake. Lucy heard him slump, moaning, to the ground. Then came the awful sound of three more heavy blows in swift succession, after which Jake moaned no further. Lucy remained completely still, crouched in the gloom of the boathouse, horrified by what she had heard and terrified of being discovered.